Tantra Illuminated with Dr. Christopher Wallace is a journey through the depths of the human experience. As viewed through the lens of the tradition called Non-Dual Shaiva Tantra. This multi-format podcast delves into the fascinating world of classical Tantra and its intersections with philosophy, neuroscience, psychology, human development, and the broader world of spirituality. This week's episode is a conversation in which I'm being interviewed by Andrew Holacek. We recorded this conversation a couple of years back for his wonderful Edge of Mind podcast, which I recommend you check out. Andrew is an author and spiritual teacher, a longtime practitioner of Buddhism, who has completed a three-year silent retreat and he teaches on the opportunities that exist in apparent obstacles on the path, as well as helping people with hardship and pain, death and dying, and challenges in meditation. He's also an expert on lucid dreaming and the Tibetan yogas of sleep and dream. So I think you'll enjoy this interview. We explore themes from my book, The Recognition Sutras, and talk about the simplicity and immediacy of the awakened state, how to access it, and how to stabilize it, as well as what makes it so extraordinary. I talk a little bit about how I came to the spiritual path, my origin story, as it were, and we discuss Tantric Shaivism and its similarities to other traditions like Dzogchen. We further discuss the challenge of working with spiritual experiences and not turning them into traps, the role of contraction and relaxation on the spiritual path, and then get into the nature of the path. How does striving along the path actually get in the way? Why do some people have awakenings that are blissful while others experience fear upon opening? What is the importance of cultural translation and how does language trap us? What is the nature of consciousness and so on? This is a wide ranging conversation, certain to stretch your mind and open your heart. And now I bring you a conversation with Andrew Holacek. Welcome everybody, Andrew Holacek here. I am actually sitting in uh, the Boulderado in Boulder, Colorado, a beautiful historical um, hotel, smack in the city of, of Boulder, with a dear friend of mine, Harish, mm. uh, AKA Chris Wallace. And uh, it's a really fortuitous opportunity for me because, uh, because Chris is literally about to leave on a plane tomorrow um, uh, for Portugal. So I tackled him on his way to the airport, <laughs> and he's going to spend some time talking to me about these extraordinary books that he's put out over the last couple of years. But um, usually what I do here, do you prefer Harish or Chris? Does it matter at this point? Um, Harish, a, yeah. a little bit. Awesome. So usually what I do, Harish, is I usually do a formal kind of introduction, but since I'm here live with you, give us a little bit about, um, tell us a little bit about your background, both academically and spiritually, because one of the things that is so compelling about your work is this really rare blend of scholar yogi. Um, mm. And that to me just has so much traction these days because mm. there's no shortage of so-called experts in the academy. But mm -hmm. for people who really walk the talk, or in this case, sit the talk, mm -hmm. it's hard to come across uh, real yogic practitioners, scholars like you. So give us a little sense of, of both your academic background, which is really impressive, and also your uh, kind of practice background and how you got so deeply embedded mm -hmm. in the Shaiva traditions. Yeah, well, and I'll preface it by saying, you know, and I'm sure you can relate to this to some extent, that... It's a little bit odd to talk about one's autobiography when one no longer identifies with that, you know, persona, that construct that, you know, it's like the 
the self, uh, as as ordinarily discussed anyway, is seen as as a social con- a social psychological construct. You know that then that then sort of destabilizes through practice and and even dissolves. You know, so it's like in relating quote unquote my background, I feel you know it's it's a little bit. It's almost like a little bit of imposter syndrome in the sense that uh, I'm like, well, I'm I'm talking about this guy who w- existed in the past, but um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's all it's all it's all true as as far as uh, you know as far as it goes. But it's yeah, it's a weird yeah. kind of uh, sensation. Um, but anyway, yeah. So let's see. I I first. I met my root guru when I was 16 and received a, a, a kind of initiation from her and a transmission for sure. Um, but I, I say kind of an initiation because there's no formal ritual or anything, but um, an, an initiatory transmission, one might say. And then, um, you know, kind of, I, I got into all kinds of stuff. Like the, there was this awakening that happened at age 16, which in the Hindu tradition anyway, that's actually the traditional age to have an awakening if you are yoga brashta, meaning if you are picking up from where you left off in the previous lifetime, mm. then you usually have your awakening at, at yeah, like 15, 16 years old. And... Um, so then I, you know, I got into meditation, but I got into everything. I got into psychedelic drugs and, you know, just exploring consciousness, you know, while, while in high school, which me- meant I almost didn't finish high school. I almost flunked out of high school and I actually finished it a little bit later at community college, you know, um, because I was just, you know, I was just lost interest in the, in the school things. And, you know, it was, it was a good school, but not a great school. And so... Uh, then, um, you know, it was after, after high school, I didn't want to go to university. That was just like academics, you know, or I, I also had a kind of hippie ethos where I thought the universities are all controlled by the man, and, you know, that's not where I want to be. But so I, I kind of, I did the theater and I traveled, uh, the world, you know, I saved up and would travel all over Europe and, and in, it went to India for the first time, which I found very frightening, <laughs> you know, overwhelming as people do. Um, now it's not at all, of course, but, um, then I, I asked myself, it was in Paris at the time and I asked myself, well, what would I do if I could do anything? You know, this is the sort of advice I gave to my friends. So I thought, well, I'll try it on myself. I thought, well, I would just, um, you know, study Indian philosophy and or, or talk about it, read about it, practice it, and then I was like, oh well, I, I you know I should uh, I should act on that then. So then I I lived in my guru's ashram for for a couple years. No, was this in India? No, this okay. is it. Her 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 ashram in New York. She has one in India where I visited, but this was in um, the New York upstate New York ashram, and. Then I met there, at the ashram, I met uh, these scholar practitioners. And I didn't really know that there were scholar practitioners as a, as a category of human. But um, So these guys, uh, Paul Muller and, and Bill Mahoney and Douglas Brooks, and they were just it seemed like wonderful people. And they were deeply studied and deeply practiced individuals, you know. So I was like, oh, wait a second, you know, this is possible. And, you know, the curriculum at the ashram didn't go that deep. So I, you know, didn't have more to learn there. I mean, of course, one can always practice more, but, you know, I didn't have more to learn per per se there. So I I felt called to to go to university with this very different kind of attitude than most people go to university in this country where I'm just here. For Indian philosophy, for Indology, you know, and I'm going to do everything I can, and you know, because Brooks and Muller were both at the same university, you could you could have a full schedule of classes in in just Asian relig- religious traditions there. But I also did other stuff like, um, uh, you know, early Christianity, you know, Kabbalah, like just comparative religion, yeah, thing. comparative religion thing, and and then. Um, then I then I took a class with Paul Muller called Hindu Tantric Yoga, 
and this was mind blowing. I mean, I'd, I had heard of and I'd read some Kashmir Shaivism, and I was always that was what it was known as back then. And I was always drawn to Kashmir Shaivism or the philosophy of the Shaiva masters of Kashmir. And then I took the Hindu Tantric Yoga class. This is in two thousand, and. I was blown away, and I read this article by Alexis Sanderson um, called Purity and Power, and it's an amazing piece of work. It's this, actually his first major academic article, and it's like <laughs> unbelievably mind-blowing. And uh, so then I was like, i got to go to Oxford. I just have to study with the best, you know? So then, so then, uh, but then to go to Oxford, you needed to have good Sanskrit, so I went to Berkeley for two years, oh. did a master's in Sanskrit, got my language skills, you know, up to par, went to Oxford, got much better Sanskrit there, and did a did a master's in philosophy with uh, yeah, Alexis Sanderson, who's the... He's the guy. He's the number one scholar of tantric studies in the world. Um, you know, he's even, he's, he's the only person alive that we know of who's read all the scriptural material of both Shaivism and Buddhism mm. and Jainism, uh, he's just literally read everything in in manuscript form. So kind of an Aristotle of the Sanskrit. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, he's a, he's ama- amazingly fluent. He can just read Sanskrit, you know, at the speed that you would read the newspaper. Yeah. So, uh, so I got to do two years with him. He's very tough. He's he's challenging. He's he's brilliant. You know. Um, and I, I managed to get a distinction, uh, a master's of philosophy with distinction at Oxford is not, not the easiest thing. But anyway, um, then from there went to Santa Barbara. I thought I would do the PhD in Santa Barbara. Um, and the, the professor, well, there were, there were a couple of people that were good there, like Vesna Wallace. Mm-hmm. She's she, remarkable. She's, right? she's, she's great. She's one of the great Kala Chakra scholars in the world. Yes, but... We, she did, wasn't teaching us any Kala Chakra, sadly. We were, we were reading Jainism materials and stuff, um, which is a little boring by comparison. But, um, yeah, she's very, very good. Um, and But then the, the, the professor there who, who's a specialist in Tantra... Um, I was disappointed with, I don't, I don't want to yeah. name, name him, sure. but I was disappointed. I realized his, his Sanskrit's not any better than mine. I need to be studying with someone who's better, you know? So, um, yeah, I went, I went back to Berkeley where a student of Sanderson's who's, who, who by then was a, was an acclaimed scholar in his own right, Somdev Vasudeva, um, was, was guest professor at Berkeley. And so I got to work with him some, he's absolutely brilliant. He's you know, ties for Sanderson's top student, which, you know, places him in a high echelon. Um, so then I finished the PhD at Berkeley and, you know, I, I sort of I skipped over some years there cause I traveled India and researched and, uh, you know, you know how your PhD can drag on <laughs> for, for quite some time. And I didn't even know if I would finish it. Um, oh because I was getting into teaching in the yoga world. So were you doing research for your, your dissertation at this point as well? Yes, yes. So I had when I'd finished all the coursework, you know, I went to India, and, and this is around when Obama was first elected, yeah. um, and, I, and I, in Nepal as well. Nepal and India, I was traveling, was researching, was just also just get, taking the opportunity to, to experience everything and see what sacred sites were still alive and, and powerful there and which weren't. Um, and, and, and so, and then, and I also got into, you know, in this time period before filing the dissertation, I got, I was getting into teaching in the yoga world and it was quite fulfilling. And I, I started to realize I don't actually need a professorship. I'd always planned on a professorship, but it's not it's not the only choice. It used to be the only one. Well, you know what Ken Wilber says about it. He, hmm. says, he says it's the killing jar of authentic spirituality. Yeah. Teaching in the academy. That's somewhat true. I mean, you can, you can manage to keep your spiritual sentiments alive, but only with a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, grad school tries to, as Joseph Campbell put it, grad, grad school tries to flatten you out, yeah. <laughs> you know. So, so were you practicing, obviously, during this entire time? Your, your yes. actual personal yogi practice was yes. always sublimating and tacking. Yes, it. yes. And I, and I went through a phase where it wasn't so strong. I was just so 
you know, like the novelty of intellectual knowledge, you know, <laughs> like, like, uh, like Shweta Ketu in the Upanishads. And I, so I, you know, fell out of practice a little bit. And then when the novelty of the intellectual knowledge wore off, I realized, well, this is the intellectual part of this is really just a hobby. Yeah. That's all it is, <laughs> you know. And over time, I lost pride in intellectual knowledge to the point that when I finally filed the, the dissertation in 2014, I felt no sense of accomplishment at all. I was like, do, do, I, do I even want to finish this? Okay, no, an intuition inside said, no, just, just, just keep going, just finish this, even though there's maybe no reason. And I filed it, and I felt not, no, no accomplishment, but, but in a good way, <laughs> like... Like, I just managed to get this done, you know, j just after losing all sense of its significance. But it did, I mean, it, you know, it made my um, mind probably work a little bit more rigorously. And ever since then, it works more rigorously, I think. But but it's not, it had no bearing, it wasn't really needed for my for my teaching career, because that was, was and still is freelance, since I decided not to do a professorship. And then it wasn't, of course, very significant at all for the spiritual life. Yeah. Well, it, it doesn't tie in a little bit, Harish, to what you were talking about at the very outset, that as elegant as it is, it's just really another refined story. Yeah. It's just a map. And no matter how elegant and subtle the map is, it, it never is the territory. Yeah. Right. Right. And you, 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 the more you explore the territory, I mean, you need a map, but the more you explore the territory and get to know it on its own terms, the more the maps seem inadequate. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and so the last piece of this is that, um, uh, when was it exactly? It would have been, yeah, before, before, definitely before I filed the dissertation, that's when like a whole nother spiritual awakening happened, not dramatic, but very significant mm -hmm. where I kind of turned a corner where I was like, Okay, I have the I have the academic knowledge, but it's not it's neither here nor there in the ultimate grand scheme of things. And I started to go deeper with practice, but this was a new kind of practice. It was it wasn't like the regimented yogi logging his yogi hours. You know, if I just log enough hours, I'll be enlightened. It wasn't that a, a, a kind of thing. You know, it was more actually being drawn to practice with no sense of should, with no sense of like, I'm trying to achieve something, but just a, a sort of deep curiosity to discover what's there to yeah. be discovered, you yeah. know, through, through practice. And yeah. I discovered that's a much more effective Motive. Well, it's interesting, Arish, because when people ask me, I, I've drunk the Buddhist Kool-Aid, it mm -hmm. speaks to me, I like that cuisine. But more and more when people ask me, are you Buddhist? I go, well, you know, sort of, kind of, but I'm mostly a curious. Yeah. I'm a curious. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. interested in what, what, is, what is this? What is this all about? Yeah. 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 And in terms of identity, I, yeah, I went from, you know, I identified with, with, uh, you know my teacher's particular movement called Siddha Yoga. I, I was a Siddha Yogi, and then then I identified more with Hinduism, and I was a Hindu, and then with Shaivism, and I was a Shaiva, and then with Tantra, and yeah. I was a Tantrika, and now none of it, all of it, none of it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You can't. Yeah, it's you don't need after. I mean, you need it maybe for a time, but after time, you don't need the identity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, one of the reasons I, I want to share this with our listeners, one of the reasons I'm so terribly excited to introduce you all, listeners, to Harish's work, um, and this is what we're going to be tiptoeing into, he's, he's the author of two seminal texts. Um, in fact, they're so seminal that I don't want to water them down by talking about both of them. Mm. The first one is a really marvelous, especially for me, really illuminating, literally illuminating mm -hmm. text, Tantra Illuminated, mm -hmm. that I found to be a spectacular way for me to contextualize my own tradition of Tibetan Tantric Buddhism. Mm -hmm. You know, like, where where did my goods come from? Mm -hmm. And so I found that book masterful. But the one that just blew my socks off that I want to spend time with you talking about today, mm. of course, is, is your masterpiece, The Recognition Sutras. Mm. And for, for our listeners out there, this is a, an extraordinary text. It's in the family, and I'd love to talk to you about this a little bit, Harish. It's in the family of what I've come to refer to as these kind of trans-religious masterpieces, like mm -hmm. in the spirit of Dzogchen or even 
um, the Kaduma tradition, the, the post Kabbalistic Jewish mystical tradition, that are that are that are teachings that are so profound that they transcend any cultural boundaries. Mm -hmm. And that's why when I read it, to me, it was just nodding my head all the time. Um, with a deep level of recognition of the confluence of this wisdom tradition with my own understanding of, of Dzogchen and Mahamudra. And what you do in such a masterful way, not only is your translation of epic proportions, is that you are also an extremely skilled cultural translator. Mm. And I think that is as important, if not more so, than, than kind of classic liturgical translation. Mm -hmm. Because we, we, we're not Indians, we're not Tibetans. Mm -hmm. We speak, I don't live in a world of chariots and mm -hmm. um, elephants. I live in a world of Apple and Amazon. Mm -hmm. And so it's your ability, your kind of synthetic, syncretic mind mm -hmm. to, to draw on psychology, even some quantum cosmology, mm -hmm. and draw all these other kind of augmenting, supporting threads within your work that takes your unpacking of this incredible masterpiece and literally translating in cultural terms that I found to be just sublime. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's so much to talk about here, but let's let's start for for some people who may not be that familiar with with Kashmir Shaivism. Um, why should we be bothered? Mm -hmm. What can Kashmir Shaivism teach the modern mind? Yeah, well, actually, <laughs> this is part of why I don't uh, use that 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 phrase that you just used, Kashmir Shaivism. I mean, the the phrase was coined by a Kashmiri uh, in 1914. So it's a modern phrase um, that doesn't have any traditional mm -hmm. correspondent. So why why do people talk about Kashmir Shaivism? It's because the tradition is actually called Tantric Shaivism or Shaiva Tantra, right? Which obviously corresponds to parallel terms like Tantric Buddhism um, or in Sanskrit you say Bauda Tantra. But anyway, the, the point is that Shaivism, Tantric Shaivism, was a pan-Indian tradition in its own time, right? Not only pan-India, it was pan-Asian. So it even made its way to Southeast Asia and Indonesia uh, in, in its... In its Borobudur. Yeah. Yes, yes, it, exactly. yes. Borobudur is a very early, early Tantric Shaiva site. And also uh, uh, um, Angkor Wat. I've been there as well, yeah. exactly. They Which, both, yeah. I went, when the first time I went to both places, I was walking around going, OMG, even though there isn't one. Yeah. What is this doing down here? <laughs> yeah. Well, and what's fascinating about Angkor Wat is it was founded as a as a tantric Shaiva kingdom first, and then later became a tantric Buddhist kingdom. Um, and it, anyway, so it's it's it was a pan Indian and indeed pan much of Asia tradition. So Kashmir, when we say Kashmir Shaivism, it makes it sound like a kind of parochial or you know it's just some weird thing from this little region. Now Kashmir, of course. Is a very special region. Well, because, Baba. I mean, talk about the hotspot, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, Kashmir Valley had a strong connection to Swat Valley. I've been there as well. Right, which it is the fabled ancient kingdom of Udiana. Exactly. Yeah, right. where yeah Padma Sambhava is from there, but also one of the main gurus of this Kashmiri Shaiva tradition, Gyananetra, uh, was also from or or was initiated in Udiana. So that is the number one sacred pilgrimage site for both Buddhism and, and, and Shaivism. Of course, no, no more, because now it's controlled by the Taliban yeah. and so on. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, just a little side note, you know, Malala Yousafzai, yeah, yeah. what an extraordinary spirit. I, I, I want to believe that she has some of that spirit of the yeah. original Udiana. Draw love, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, the the uh, the the way that the misunderstanding came about um, was that the most famous and most brilliant authors of the tantric tradition of Shaivism came from Kashmir or lived in the Kashmir Valley. You know, so their writings survived even when uh, you know most of the tradition you know didn't didn't survive muslim conquest or or colonialism it did in various little pockets in various little ways but what had been a very a, a vast coherent um you know tradition an edifice of of practice and scholarship you know was mostly decimated by the muslim conquests and then colonialism so anyway, the, the, so the writings, the people knew who read Sanskrit, you know, which is obviously a small enough number, but people, who, people knew that the, there were these amazing writings from 
Kashmir Valley. So it became the, that body of material became known as Kashmir Shaivism. But they were really commenting on this pan-Indian uh, tantric spiritual tradition, which was, um, you know, paralleled uh, over in, in Tibet and Nepal. And, and, you know, so um, it's important to see it not as its own little siloed yeah. thing, but in that in that larger context. Yeah. So then your actual question is, <laughs> you know, what is it? What does it have to, to, to teach us? I mean. I think it's fair to say that even though modern humans might imagine that we're as advanced as humans have ever been in any in any field it's it's not true we're not as advanced as we've ever been in the in the empirical study of consciousness and and these were folks who I mean it used to be true in many parts of India and it was true in Kashmir that they had as it were government research grants mm -hmm. <laughs> the king or the court authorized stipends for people to practice and study full-time who were not monastics, right? So this is the thing. Unlike Tibet, which had a monasticized system, which then f created institutional norms that were sometimes, uh, you know, problematic, this, these were um, householder, you know, uh, 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 scholars and yogis and, and practitioners. Yep. And um, so, yeah, so they would get these uh, stipends <laughs> and... And so, yeah, it was it was government-funded meditation research for many, many centuries, actually. And because of that, partially because of that, you know, there, there people made extraordinary breakthroughs in understanding consciousness. And, um, you know, one example would be in the in the Krama lineage of of Shaivism, which flourished in Kashmir, and again based in uh, uh, Udiana, they made minute analyses of the nature of cognition, not just consciousness generally, because any mystic can talk about consciousness in a vague general way, but they made minute analyses of how consciousness manifested its content moment to moment. Mm -hmm. You know, so the Krama lineage is so-called because they analyzed the Krama or the sequences, the, the phases of consciousness in each and every cognitive event. So somewhat akin to perhaps through the Abhidharma tradition or more like Pramana in the Buddhist yoga sense? Um, is there a confluence between either of those that you would correlate? Uh, well, between those two, a bit closer to, to Abhidharma, but but it's, you know, <laughs> kind of why it makes it hard to describe is this this apparent scholasticism was in this tradition intimately married to radical rites of transgression of consciousness expansion so these were the same guy the same guys who did these these you know almost um these analyses that got into the minutia of of the nature of consciousness yeah, were also atomistic nature of mind yeah well, they were also the same people though that were doing the most transgressive rituals mm -hmm. you know and uh you know experimenting with with different kind of methods for for consciousness expansion through bodily discipline, through through dream yoga, um, through you know occasionally psychoactive plants like datura, hmm. uh, inhaling datura smoke, through um, uh, uh, sexual rituals that, when combined with highly advanced forms of meditation, produce these yeah. you know sublime exactly. states. Um, but ultimately, what's interesting is that because people are all fascinated by these peak experiences, right. sublime states, altered states of consciousness. But what these guys ended up deciding, having experienced all that in, in, in the Krama lineage, was that the nature of consciousness, it can be discovered in, in any experience whatsoever. And this is in the, the book, the Recognition Sutras. This teaching, it's first introduced as one of the alternate translations of, or, or alternate readings of the first sutra. The Kshemaraja, the author, says, you know, the sutra is also telling us that the nature of consciousness, our, our, our own deepest, truest, unborn, undying, infinite nature, can be discovered through any experience whatsoever. It doesn't take peak experience. Hence the term recognition. Yeah, yeah, it can be recognized. Yeah. And that peak experiences in that sense can be a distraction. It, absolutely. Right. But absolutely. also, we also, I would say, need peak experiences in order to recognize, oh, okay, so, so my essence nature or consciousness itself is that which 
is actually the same in the peak experience and, right. in, and in the board experience, you know. Exactly right. But, of course, if you really discover the nature of consciousness, you can't be bored anymore. <laughs> so that's not really possible. First of all, there's no it's, you to be bored, right? Yes, yes. And, you, so, and it's just, and, and consciousness itself is fascinating in whatever form it's arising. Yeah, Leela, it's always, it's always a play. It's always a dance. Yeah. It's a dynamic energy. Yeah. yeah. And so what's interesting here, Harish, is that, you know, I find it very interesting when people talk about, even in this modern age, psychotropic agents and, and ways to alter consciousness. I mean, I think you might agree with me that fundamentally, this is the altered state. Mm. In other words, seeing the world dualistically, mm. seeing it through a samsaric lens, that's the altered state. Mm -hmm. That's what we call, in, in the Tibetan tradition, the term for temporary experience, and it's a hugely important term, it's called yam. And yam, by definition, always has a beginning and an end. It's like morning mist. Mm -hmm. And with proper tools and, and practices of maturation, it fundamentally transforms into tokpa, which is, in fact, stability. Mm -hmm. And so on a really um, deep level, uh, just because this particular nyam has been going on for so long, we don't see that this is the nyam. Mm -hmm. This is the altered state. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally then what happens is this, and this is why I, when I, I read the title, when I think about um, what the Tibetans refer to as the nintig, heart essence teachings, if I had to summarize like one word the entire spiritual path, mm -hmm. and also, by the way, parenthetically, best preparation for death, mm -hmm. relaxation, mm -hmm. or recognition. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, what happens is, through the proper view that you put forth in, the, in this text, realizing mm -hmm. that fundamentally this is, in fact, the altered state, mm -hmm. then either through recognition or relaxation, be interesting to parse out what the mm -hmm. subtle differences may be there, it's always already present. And it's yes. like you say repeatedly in this text. It's basically 400 pages of saying the same thing. Yes. Which is brilliant. <laughs> yes. What you're looking for is hiding in plain sight. Yes. And we yes. just simply have to recognize. We simply have yeah. to open, relax, and it's always already there. Yeah. And then so stop looking. It's like you say over and over. It's like, you know, my teacher, Vidadara Trungpa Rinpoche, at the highest level, striving is the only obstacle. Yes. Just let it go. Yes. And like you say, you know, the, the seeking denotes the absence of what you see. Yeah. Even even the path itself, therefore, in a very real way, sets even the notion of path sets us in the wrong direction. In a yeah. relative way. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Except for at the beginning, I think it's it's good to have a notion of path to get the to get a practitioner oriented, but. Oftentimes, people hold on to that notion far past its expiration date, you know. So, yeah, I want to comment on, on some of the things you said. Um, relaxation and recognition, I think you need both. Because I would say the key is that, yeah, people are striving to become enlightened or, or recognize their essence nature or, or to, you know, achieve something, Right. But the irony is that it's through relaxing so deeply. And, and the problem is in our culture, we now associate relaxing with, you know, glass of wine, Netflix, and dog, which is great, by the way. I'm not knocking it, you know, <laughs> partner or pet and, 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 and alcohol and movies. That's relaxation. And it can be a kind of relaxation, but it's nowhere near, as you know. There's nowhere near this kind of deep psychic and physical relaxation where what happens is if, if you're if you're lucky if you relax enough you sort of slip out of your self images so i use the image like you know the, the metaphorical image of like houdini you know he would get he would escape his being tied up by relaxing so completely yeah, you know he would tense when he got tied up and then he would relax so completely he could just slip out of his bonds and and it's relaxing out of our our need to be right, our self images, our you know opinions and narratives and stories, and but all of that. But most importantly, the self images, yeah. and then recognition can happen easily because yeah. there you know, it's just wait a second, just being, just being itself is is what's being recognized, and it's not personal, which you know because people are looking for my soul or my essence, and there's no such thing, of course, really, you know. So uh, I would say you have to have both the, yeah. the relaxation and, and, and yeah. which which facilitates the recognition. And isn't it isn't it just the ultimate irony, um, Harish, that that um, 
the constancy masks the recognition. Yeah. You know, that the, it's, the, it, it, it's like they say in the Mahamudra tradition, you know, it's so obvious you don't see it. It's so simple you don't trust it. It's so easy you don't believe it. And so what I playfully say to uh, when I riff on these sorts of things, it's like we're looking for Hollywood when it's more like Kansas. Mm. You know, in, in Tibetan, the term is Tamagi Shepa, which literally means ordinary mind. Right. And it doesn't mean ordinary again in the colloquial sense. It, it actually means foundational mind. Yeah, exactly. That, that it's so utterly ordinary. In fact, often when people get it, mm -hmm. so to speak, um, they will often come out saying, can it really be that simple? Yeah. And yeah. that's because of, you know, it's like you say in your book so beautifully, you know, reality is simple. Delusion is what's complicated. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit as a way to back into this. If in fact, and the reason that this is a little bit selfish on my part, because mm. I'm actually I'm drafting a book now that I'd, I'd love to get your riff on this because you talk about this again. It's one of the central narratives of the Recognition Sutras. The opposite of relaxation is contraction. Mm -hmm. And I'm writing an entire book on contraction because mm -hmm. it has tremendous applicability in the um, Bardo literature. Mm -hmm. It is that which actually creates the kind of condensation of awareness from mm -hmm. the completely formless shunyata, you know, fundamentally contraction out of the thermonuclear, from fear, mm -hmm. you know, the thermonuclear power of the mind, mm -hmm. fear of nothingness, fear of, of, of everythingness. Yeah. And eventually in a series of really painful contractions, which are reiterated every time we grasp after something, mm -hmm. we contract out of this natural state all the time. So talk yeah. to us a little bit about, because there's a beautiful narrative in your book, about the place of contraction in the origin of the samsaric agenda. Yeah. Well, I think what's really important to emphasize, because a lot of people in, in the spiritual life and don't get this, um, that contraction, it can have, you know, a positive or negative valence vis-a-vis -vis the, the whole spiritual project. I think contraction in Sanskrit is sankocha, which means pulling in. And that's not necessarily, uh, you know, bad, but the, the, the type of contraction that is, you know, that causes suffering and is antithetical to spiritual realization is self-referential contraction. So it's this whole thing of like, I'm hurting. It's not fair what they did to me. And, you know, it's this whole, the self-referential contraction is in in a sense artificial because it's based on this artificial notion of of a separate self which seems of course completely real until it doesn't and so people who haven't glimpsed the unreality of the of the self think we're just talking nonsense <laughs> you know but it, it it's important to note that there's a, there's forms of contraction that are not self-referential and that are not problematic if you learn how to um, hold space for the contraction. Yeah. In fact, it wouldn't it be fair to say that without healthy contraction, we wouldn't be here talking about the nature of contraction. Well, sure, because, because it, at the most fundamental level, contraction is necessary for there to be the human, human bodies and, yeah. and, you know, trees and planets and <laughs> stars. Um, and, you know, the, the contraction in this healthy way right, uh, is actually a precondition for further expansion. So it's, it's a prerequisite in that sense, you know, you, because according to, anyway, uh, Tantric Shaivism, consciousness naturally cycles through phases of contraction and expansion. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's spanda, this mm -hmm. oscillation, mm -hmm. right? So when you're able to hold space for the contracted state without believing the mind's stories about it, um, you're already setting up the conditions for it to uh, create a further expansion. So it's natural for the energy to want to pull in. And it, when it pulls in, it can feel like intensity. And intensity to many people can, you, can feel like pain. But if you actually look at it, it's not pain. It's just intensity. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. The energy is pulled in, so it's concentrated. Mm -hmm. So it can be sometimes even almost unbearably intense. But you just hold space for that. And you realize, if you can realize, oh, this this isn't anger, this isn't pain, this isn't fear, until I label it that oh, way. I need it. Yeah. 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 Reference it. It's just intensity. Yep. Yeah. So then it can, you know, Kshemadaja actually says in, in the Recognition Sutras, if you can go all the way into center, 
then a kind of special reaction happens, you know, where, where if, if, if the energy is allowed to come all the way into the center, then it bangs out, out again. <laughs> the Sanskrit word is vispara. It's this explosive expansion. Like a mobius strip. I mean, it comes back in. And yeah, then... yeah it, comes, it, comes, it has to come round again, but only if you let it go all the way in, see, so people don't yeah, get yeah. the expansion because they resist yep, yep. the energy yep. and, and they don't let it all and the way in. And hence some scars are born. Yeah, exa- yeah, from resisting. But if you let it come all the way in and it, and it expands again, then you, you can actually realize, oh, that, that had to happen for this to be now happening. Yeah. yeah. So let's make this practical. Um, because I think that's the, that's the genius of, of this journey is, is the brilliance of the map and the immediate invitation to explore it in mm-hmm. the territory. And that's what, I, that's what I really want to explore with you is the utter immediacy of these skillful means and mm. the applicability of them. Mm. Because this also ties in just parenthetically, and I don't, I don't think it's completely fair, but I, don't, I also think it's interesting to play a little bit of the comparative game when we're talking in the Bardo literature about staying with the bright light. Mm-hmm. This is one rendering of that. Mm-hmm. And because, in fact, what happens allegedly in the after-death state, because the Bardo teachings, as you know, that's just an archetype or Bardo principle in daily life. Mm-hmm. And what I always like to, to play with is, okay, what does it mean to relate to this intensity here? Mm-hmm. You know, And so it, for applicability and immediacy, how can the listener work with this. Let's yeah. say, for instance, they're involved, like, right now, our time is so charged. There's so much aggression. Yeah. There's so much clash activity. Yeah. How can we take this body of teachings and the next time we have an emotional upheaval, really bring it as a tantrika yeah. onto the spiritual path and work with this? Yeah. Well, uh, you might have heard this phrase because I, I think it actually comes from tantric Buddhism. There's, there's like this prayer may I not see the conditions as inhospitable to practice, <laughs> right? And I think people use anything as an excuse because it, the, the ego mind wants to get out of awakening any way it can. And like, oh, you know, we're in particularly stressful times or, or uh, you know, we're in particularly challenging times, I think is actually not true. That if you look at human life throughout the centuries... Uh, you realize, oh, we've just been incredibly lucky the last few decades. (laughs) In general, human life is extraordinarily challenging and has has many times been far, far, far more challenging than now. Um, And and so, you know, there's no better time than now Mm. to realize the truth. This is is a really important thing to to understand. Um, So given that that's the case, there... I would even say there's no actual obstacle that this is a misunderstanding people have that something could be an obstacle like, oh, you know, my family situation or my living situation is the obstacle or my, you know, my, my country is, you know, up to no good or whatever, all the things that people make, but there is no obstacle to, to realization and realization, like you said, is, is very simple. So simple, it's easy to miss. But if I, if I were to put it in a nutshell, um, and I think there's correspondence between our, our two traditions, but this is certainly how we would say it from, from this side, is we need to, as, as Lama Yeshe put it, overthrow the tyranny appearance. of ordinary appearances. And so you, we need to recognize, and this sounds esoteric when we put it into words, we need to recognize that there are no objects, there are no you know, uh, persons, there's only energy. There's only energy in an endless fluxing dance and consciousness, because energy, of course, is consciousness made manifest. So we could say consciousness has these two aspects, right? Uh, formless consciousness, um, which you can call shunyata also, uh, in this, in this, in one reading of that word anyway. Um, and then consciousness with form, which is energy, right? So, it, again, it sounds esoteric, but it ends up being the most practical thing in the world because if you start perceiving everything as an ocean of energy, as interacting forms of interdependent energy, right, ever dancing with itself, everything is, is, is in pattern. You know, everything is patterned in this energy, uh, whether it's manifesting as social movements, whether it's manifesting as 
you know, meteorological events, whether it's, everything is part of a pattern. And as you start to perceive that pattern from just tuning into the pure energy nature of reality, you, you start to realize, oh, I can actually uh, surf these waves, <laughs> you know? In other words, when, when I believe just the stories in my head and the stories other people are telling, and if I believe I'm in a world of objects that, that kind of menace me, <laughs> you know, um, and that I'm a tiny little person in this big uncaring world, you know, then I'm, I'm virtually paralyzed right. and I'm almost non-functional. And when I realize this is all conscious, this is all a play of consciousness, yeah. a dynamic play of consciousness in the form of energetic pattern. And I am that. I am this consciousness. I'm not a little thing, a victim of the universe. Yeah. I am the whole pattern. And as I tune into that through practice, through, you know, but through this sort of Dzogchen type practice that's not, it's not logging endless hours of earning merit or any of that stuff. It's, it's focused on directly realizing the nature of reality and, and surrendering to it and learning to ride the currents. And then everything sort of unfolds, you know, almost like magic, you know, um, yeah, so and, and and that and that's sort of this is both the answer to your question of part part of what these this ancient tradition has to teach us and um, what you know how how this seemingly esoteric thing can be yeah. relevant to yeah modern practitioners absolutely and so so for people who are listening Harish what what are some markers because the subtle nature of this the constancy of it um, makes it difficult to register mm -hmm. and so. For people who are listening, what are some of the markers when you are, when, from whatever, you know, whatever term you want to append to it, when you click into that, when you actually have that recognition, mm -hmm. how do you know? I mean, how can you confirm that with your own experience? Because again, in my tradition, we have what's called a pointing out transmission, which mm -hmm. is an event, as you know, where the, where the guru creates an environment mm -hmm. and they actually um, transmit the, the nature of reality. And mm -hmm. very often, and somewhat as, as I was alluding to earlier, I, I have to chuckle because I've attended many of these events. I've been very fortunate. And every single time, especially if it's a large event, mm -hmm. you, I walk into the lobby or whatever and people are kind of, did you get it? Did you get it? Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking at each other. And so for people, especially... <laughs> For people um, who are listening, how do they know yeah. when they're in that zone, when they've clicked into reality? Because it's usually so fleeting or whatever. But how yeah. can we help them really recognize what needs to be recognized? Yeah. Um, yeah. So <laughs> the thing that makes it hard to answer that is is that it, it can depend on the person, right? Because when this habitual sense of st of self gets challenged and starts to fall apart and when the habitual sense of of the world as a world full of you know objects gets gets uh, undermined for some people they just they just sort of launch into this blissful peak experience of of you know i i'm fully i'm finally fully alive everything is incredibly vivid and 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 sort of pulsing with energy and other people find it incredibly challenging and frightening, you know, because, because, well, ev everything I thought I was true turns out to be nothing but a thought. <laughs> and I've never recognized reality apart from through the lens of thought. Yeah. So this is really, it can be destabilizing, disorienting, frightening. You can feel vulnerable. You Almost can, like you sense like you're losing your mind. Even. Yes, you can yeah. feel like you're losing your mind. You can feel like you're so vulnerable, like your, your skin is being flayed off yeah. your body. Um, and, and those are, <laughs> from, so from the point of view of phenomenology, you know, just experience, those are radically different <laughs> experiences. And people are like, I'll, I'll take the first right. one, please. But you can't control it and you can't predict it. And what we can say is that it's worth going through the process, regardless of whether it's pleasurable or not. Yeah. And it's not. What's interesting to me is that the the pleasurable version of of awakening to reality mm -hmm. is not necessarily predictive that that person will stabilize in yep. awakeness. So it may be, it may be not. But there's no direct correlation between whether this is very frightening or 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 more pleasurable. Uh, and, and where the person sort of ends up. But the other signs I would say is that, um, 
you know, reality becomes a lot more fluid. Yeah. You might uh, you might start to see an equalization of of dream and and waking state. Bingo. There maybe is, you know, maybe these even these names are are they are wrong. These are just two different yeah. modes of consciousness, and they're they're equally real. That's the important thing is from, you know, because people are always asking, you know, me and I'm sure others who teach this stuff. Well, I, I had this experience. Is it real? Or I heard about this. Pos- is that real? And it's like, wait a second. You, you're not really getting a fundamental thing here, which is that everything is consciousness in this in this view and in this experience. So everything is real or everything is unreal, depending on how you want to put it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, right. um, you know, so people are usually asking the wrong question. And, and, and the, the right question, I think, is, um, is, is, is this certain kind of experience idiosyncratic to, to this locus of consciousness called me? Yeah. Or is it something that everyone experiences? You know, that's often what they mean when they say, is it real or is it normal? <laughs> you know? But, but yeah, that, 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 the waking state can become more dreamlike. The dream state yeah. can become more, yeah. more, more lucid. And one way the tradition, you know, fosters this inquiry is they say, investigate that aspect of, well, actually, let me phrase it the other way. Um, they say, how would you evaluate yourself? How would you assess the nature of your own being if you were to take all states of consciousness equally? If you were to take waking, dreaming, deep sleep, yeah. meditation, yeah. and altered states, all as equally telling you about the nature of consciousness, not one more than the other. Right. And then you discover, Beautiful. whoa, yeah, this is, Beautiful. it's quite profound, that contemplation. It's literally in, in the Mahamudra, the four stages of Mahamudra, is called Rukchik, which is the literally one taste. Yeah. Or as you put in your book, everything tastes like God. Yeah. Which is just fantastic. And so I, I, I want to toss this your way. First of all, I completely agree. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that I have, because I've been so fortunate to have these transmission experiences, sometimes completely serendipitously, just being in the presence of someone. I mean, they're mm-hmm. transmitting all the time, right? Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of like, will I receive that Abhisheka? Mm-hmm. Am I an open enough vessel? Mm-hmm. But one, one a playful one, especially now for me, um, has a little bit more applicability because of my work in, in dream yoga, is exactly what you said, Harvish, where the, the, the entire arena it just appears like a dream. Mm. It's as if my consciousness just opens to this flexible, porous, malleable, empty, dreamlike experience. And to mm-hmm. me, I have to throw this into the mix, very often... Um, I play with the notion like the Buddha, the awakened one. Mm-hmm. What did he wake up from? What did he wake up to? Mm-hmm. Well, he woke up from a reified, concretized, materialistic, impu- imputed reality, mm-hmm. nightmare of reification. Mm-hmm. He woke up to a dreamlike reality. So mm-hmm. we've got it completely ass backwards. Mm-hmm. What we actually deem as the waking state is actually completely antithetical to what the Buddha actually awoke up. Um, two, which yeah, is yeah. a dreamlike reality. Yeah. But the other thing I wanted to see if this lands with you, wouldn't it be fair to say, Harish, that, that the level, I want to go back to these two kind of interpretations or, or registers of the experience, wouldn't it be fair to say that the pleasurable component would in fact be directly proportional to the level of contraction that precedes the experience? In other words, if you're really contracted, then when you open, it can p- appear completely ecstatic. If you're already pretty open, it can be a- appear quite ordinary. And the reason I mention this, let me see if this lands with you, is, mm. is Suzuki Roshi allegedly, mm. famously said, enlightenment was my biggest disappointment. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. It mm-hmm. was like the ultimate letdown, isn't mm-hmm. it? He was actually let down into the fabric of the ordinary mind. And yeah. because he was already so open and relaxed... The contrast wasn't there. Yeah. And hence, the, the ecstasy is proportional to the level of preceding agony. I mean, couldn't you say that's... We, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would actually be interested to do a proper study and see if we can if we can establish, like, you know, a significant correlation there. Um, because intuitively, it seems right. We could talk in terms of three, three possible modes, then, if we add Suzuki's, where, where it's just, oh, it's just so simple. I've been searching... And the searching itself was blocking me seeing what's what's already right here, right now. Um, 
there's that is absolutely a true mode of realization. I I, I hesitate, you know, to, to to teach about it because people can easily mistake a mental construct of reality for reality, like a very subtle metaphor. Yeah, right? exactly, because they've yeah. received these teachings and yep. then they see through the lens of that thought. Yep. But it's actually deeper than that. Yep. It's it's beyond thought, right? Um, but in terms of these other two, I was mentioning of like the person who's having the blissful awakening and the person who's having the terrifying awakening, I do think it's probable we would see a correlation such as you described that the person who's having the terrifying awakening had a lot invested in their um, personality construct and their role, their character in, in the world. You know, mm -hmm. usually they had a lot invested in that. And so the destabilization of the artificial, you know, persona, the, this, this, this mere mental construct that they thought was the self is frightening, right? And, and oftentimes the person who has a blissful sort of uh, awakening of like, uh, of becoming fully alive and vivid is, is the person often who was ready to die, mm -hmm. who was ready to kill themselves mm -hmm. if they couldn't find any mm -hmm. meaning and they couldn't. And, and indeed one can never find deep meaning in conceptual yeah. reality you find the meaning in non-conceptual that's why nobody can tell you the meaning of life right because <laughs> the meaning is non-conceptual but that person who's like this is all bullshit this is all meaningless bullshit but then discovers the non-conceptual meaning through awakening yeah. then they're likely to have that very blissful yeah. one but i'm not sure we could say it's predictive i just yeah. think we we'll, we'll, we'll find a fair amount of correlation do there. you think i wish it would be fair because i I've, I've actually reflected on this a great deal because when i did my really long retreat and I had these so-called spontaneous um, awakenings uh, even before that. Before they became blissful, they were really pretty terrifying. Mm. And what I noticed, somewhat retrospectively, but because I've had, you know, again, a number of these, what I've noticed, I'm curious if this lands with you, is that if, if the initial opening is simply left as it is, utterly, completely non-problematic. Mm -hmm. In fact, the or literally the great bliss, the ordinary great bliss. Yeah. But what I find is this kind of lightning fast contraction mm -hmm. that that often comes into play after that lightning bolt strikes, then the mm -hmm. thunder, then the thunderclap. Mm -hmm. There's something says back there, some scars activated, wherever. Well, wait a second, where do I fit into this? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because it's a death threat. In fact, it is death. Yeah. And so, to me, when I touch into when, when I've had those kind of terrifying reactivities. Mm -hmm. Almost, not almost, every time it's because I'm appropriating, I'm referencing even that experience. Yes. That's what creates the terror. Yes. Because I'm referring it to nothing. Yes. And the actualization <laughs> that, hey, the, the, this, this, it, this rug has been pulled out, man, and there is no ground. Yeah. That brings about whoop, that fundamental archetypal con contraction mm -hmm. upon which all the other secondary, tertiary, quaternary contractions that really constitute the entirety of our lives mm. are actually, you know, um, confabulated on top of that primordial cramp. Yeah. So is that a fair way to look at it from your experience? And yeah. I mean, it's, but it's like so bizarrely ironic, isn't it? Because this, this contraction, like, yeah, what, what does this mean for me? Or what is, or, or the contraction of, of this process could kill me. You know, the spiritual awakening process could or will kill me. The irony is that that's absolutely right, but only in the literal sense, meaning it's going to kill that type of thought process. Yeah. You know, and that's all that's actually there. You think there's a me there that could be annihilated, and there's not. There's just a, a thought that will be annihilated, you know? So it's, it's, it's what's weird about it. It's like, how do we even explain this? Because the thought, the thought, the conditioned thought process itself is like trying to self-perpetuate. You know, it's trying to cling to life, even though it's nothing but a thought. Storyline. It's a storyline. Yeah. Endless yeah, storyline. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and everybody wants to bring their autobiographical storyline to a great yeah. conclusion, a great climax. And oftentimes that's why people get involved in spirituality. It's like, ah, what a great climax to my personal life story. I'll get enlightened. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know? And of course it doesn't work that way. And, 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 you know, the, to let go of the autobiograph autobiographical way of thinking of the me is so frightening. And yet once you've done it, you're like, yeah how why did i take so long exactly. why did i resist this so much yeah. 
you know, why was there so much resistance? Because in fact, it's just a huge relief. Exactly. It's just, yeah. The ultimate orgasm. The yeah. Ultimate, ultimate ordinary <laughs> orgasm. Yeah. And what, what I found here, Risha, as well, and this is why so I'm, I'm, I'm so inspired to, to riff on this book that I'm drafting, is that, and I'm curious if this lands with your experience as well, is that when I, when I feel that experience, without examination, uh, when I feel the contraction, without examination, it in fact feels like I'm contracting onto self. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I look deeper, I actually realize I'm contracting onto nothing. Mm-hmm. And it is the contraction itself that mm-hmm. generates the illusion of self. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually not contracting onto anything. Right. But when I'm doing that in secondary, tertiary, quaternary ways, which constitutes my life, like mm-hmm. I'm doing this, I'm experiencing that, those mm-hmm. are secondary, tertiary levels of contraction. But the fundamental primordial cramp is in fact contraction itself. Mm-hmm. And that's born, it's like, again, like the master of the one, one line that Trung Prambache once said, space is the Buddhist version of God. Mm-hmm. And we're afraid of this God because there's no room for personal identity. Mm-hmm. And so then when we experience that, just because of the samskaras and all the habituation, the natural ultimate self-defense, right? Ultimate mm-hmm. self-defense is to contract. Mm-hmm. The very contraction to self creates the illusion of self. Yes. And then from there... There it goes. Yeah. Bingo. That's the big bang, or in this case, the big crunch. Yes. <laughs> it gives birth to the whole samsara trip. Yes. Yeah. And the key, the, the way that the Shaivas um, talk about this is the key there, the, the, the understanding that solves this, as it were, is to see that this contraction not only is not a contraction of self, it is part of the world of phenomena, just like everything else. So, you know, you have a clear blue sky and then a storm blows in, but you don't take it personally, you're like, if, unless you're crazy, right? You're not like, why is this storm doing this to me? Uh, you know, it's just a storm and it can be beautiful. And in the same way, whatever this, whatever this sort of psychic energy does, because there is psychic energy generated by the body-mind system, whatever it does, and contraction, emotion, whatever, it's just part of the phenomena that consciousness hosts, you know, hold, hold space for. And, and it's no different, and it's no more personal than any other phenomena. So that that is really the solution, and and of course it's you know easy enough to say in words, but to relentlessly, like I would say to people, including your listeners, it would be better to never sit for formal meditation at all, and and just do this if you had to choose, which is day to day, moment to moment, yeah. attending to the fact that all that exists is consciousness and its contents. And that all the contents are ever changing, ever flexing, impermanent, and potentially can be seen as, as beautiful in its impermanence, right? And that consciousness itself is untouched by all these contractions and expansions, and you know, in its most basic nature, what you might call ordinary mind. And if you're attending to that a lot, yeah. then you don't even need formal meditation Fantastic. necessarily. Fantastic. And therefore, you find the divinity and the sacredness even in contraction itself. Yeah, and that's super important because it's it's very easy to get into this uh, like all of a sudden contraction is the enemy. Well, there is no enemy. Right. It's like you say so beautifully in your book. I applaud you for this. There's fundamentally no ignorance, no evil. Those are just mm. reifications of partial knowledge. Yeah. Reifications of confusion. Yeah. That in itself is colossal insight. Yeah. Because otherwise, what we do is we tend to reify, and the minute again, the minute you do that, that's virtually to me synonymous with contraction Mm -hmm. they're they're inseparable yeah and you can identify with your contraction or other people's because if you you know if you identify uh, other people's contraction as bad wrong evil you know then it sets up this opposition that and 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 this is where people easily get confused because you can have social political opposition without having spiritual existential opposition in your being because if to 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 exist in awakeness is to be undivided there's no division there's no opposition but that doesn't mean you can't march in a there's protest exactly. <laughs> you can, yeah you can go march in a protest but there's no opposition yeah. in your yeah. heart you're just marching in the protest because you feel this is the right thing yeah. to do yeah. in this situation so in other words, you know, if I see somebody on the street, like abusing somebody, you know, I'll intervene if I can. But I never feel that that person is a different 
category of human, an evil kind or a criminal kind. There's no such thing. Yeah. Right. Those are just mental constructs. So, so, you know, all these forms of contraction and expansion and come and go, all these fluxes of energy. And, you know, what people often don't realize is that, is that you can, sur- you can learn to surrender at such a deep level that even, even really painful events, like for me, it's sort of like, you know, there's this first moment of, oh gosh, this is painful, this hurts. And then a, a moment later, it's painful. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It, it hurts. It's okay. And that can seem very distant to, 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 to many people, but it's not as distant as it seems. It's actually a, a corollary of realizing the nature of reality, you know, because then once you, once you are aware of, of the nature of reality, then you realize, well, to resist the pain That's right. just makes it even more painful. Well, it, makes it, suffer, it turns it into suffering. I yeah. mean, I, I yeah. have this in, in, um, in the Mahamudra tradition, Harish, they have a really uh, brilliant set of practices that are um, powerfully um, supportive of the Bardo journey. Hmm. They're literally called reverse meditations. Hmm. And reverse for several reasons. One is they're, they're reverse of what we usually think of. In other words, you actually volitionally bring about unwanted circumstance, like pain or cacophony or those types of things. Mm-hmm. And they're also called reverse because the practice is indeed to reverse our usually normally adverse relationship to them, which is what? To contract. Mm-hmm. So they're invitations to open in the yeah. midst of heightened contraction. Yeah. And so within that, there's I have this little equation, S equals P times R. Mm-hmm. Suffering equals pain times resistance. Yeah. Drop yeah. the resistance, what happens to the suffering? Suffering goes away. Yeah. Then you're left with this thing called pain. Well, what is pain? Yeah. And then you look very deeply into that and you discover what we talked about um, a yeah. few minutes ago. Intensity. This intense yeah. awareness, this intense pointed consciousness. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk. Uh, again, I want to be practical, as practical as we can. Let's talk about stability. Mm. Let's so we have somebody has this insight. Mm-hmm. Um, they have this transmission. Houston Smith, you know, one of my favorite um, scholars, once said in a very famous line, "The process of the path is to transform flashes of illumination into abiding light." Mm-hmm. This is beautiful. Mm-hmm. So, how when we have these glimpses? So, we've had a few metrics, a few markers for what this opening may be like. Mm-hmm. How do we then bring that non-path onto the path? How do we how do we gain stability outside of what you were alluding to earlier? Just that you know, short sessions repeated frequently, moments of recognition. Are there other other ways that one can work to stabilize these types of openings? Well, I think uh, you know the problem with the Houston Smith quote is how easy it is to misinterpret because. People are going to, often are going to hear that you know the, the the flashes of insight you know how to make them abiding illumination, but they're going to interpret that in terms of experience. Mm-hmm. How can I experience mm-hmm. X all the time, bliss all the time, or you know something something analogous to that? And of course that that doesn't mm-hmm. work. That's not you can't you can't have any experience permanently, right? There would be assurance. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, there, so. But people, you know, what I would advise folks is, is look very closely to see if you are, in fact, trying to get some sort of experience uh, at, all the time, as that's your version of awakeness or enlightenment or liberation, and instead orient to, um, uh, Abhinavagupta used the word vishranti, and that means repose in the, in the sort of deepest level of your being. Of course, language fails us because it's not like there's really levels, but um, Vishranti is this point within consciousness where where consciousness comes to rest in itself. Mm. Mm. And mm. now, you know, for Vedantins, you know, they, they, they call this witness consciousness, yeah. Yeah. but it's actually deeper because what we see in Tantra is that witness consciousness is itself a subtle kind of dissociation. I'm going to stand back and hold everything at arm's length and be a passive witness 
and I will not be hurt by the world. You know, it's a kind of dissociation, which is great for some people. You know, sometimes you actually need provisional stuff. Yeah. yeah, you need provisional spiritual healthy dissociation, but the, but not ultimately, right? You can't hold everything at arm's length. You know, so this vishranti that that Gupta was talking about is repose in your in your center, and that's a, of course a metaphorical term. It's not that there's literally a cent- center to consciousness, but I do sometimes direct people somatically to the base of the heart mm. or even the back of the base of the heart. Oh, beautiful. And that's just a cue that, that's beautiful. helpful because in this true centeredness, you don't push anything away, but you also don't grab for anything. So you know, one of my teachers calls it neither ownership nor denial of ownership. Yeah. And so in this, in this Vishranti, the centeredness, there is intimacy with reality, but not getting caught up in it, in, in, in a way. So that's really what we want to stabilize. Not you know, because you can't stabilize anything else. So so not not the feeling of you know, oh, I've just had an amazing insight, yeah. you know, or not the not not the highs, or you know, and uh, the irony is, if you do stabilize in your in your absolute center joy comes more naturally and easily and frequently, mm. right? But you can't have constant joy, you know? Um, so is that, even, is that even the right question then? Mm. Because this is, I, I'm really deeply interested in, um, in the notion of, of the Socratic approach. And even with the Buddha, the Buddha allegedly, when he was asked a number of these kind of unanswerable questions, he would mm. either remain in silence mm-hmm. Or he would sometimes say in contemporary translation, the question is erroneously posited. Mm -hmm. In other words, just by the way you ask the question, you're sending the mind in the right direction. And I always throw this into the mix. Heisenberg allegedly said a fantastic statement when he said, you know, what we discover with science is not reality itself, but reality as it's revealed through our methods of investigation. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, when I even ask you the question about stability, Mm -hmm. is that even the right question? I mean, is there another way to query that, to turn this non-path into a, a path? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I, I I actually think stability is a great orienting word as far as words go, because it of course it, all words have a, are going to have a problem, and stability has the problem of like people getting the wrong impression they need to stabilize in something in some experience or 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 frame of mind but still stability i mean i think any anyone you know who's gone through the awakening process can talk about this that that stability ends up becoming something very important in terms of like are you are you stabilized in your ability to to see things clearly and accurately you know or, or, or is that becoming stable because again all the language of you and that's that's just the, the fiction but i mean there's the phenomenon of you know i got it i lost it mm-hmm. as adya shanti talks about it but people you know when they're t- saying i i had it and then i lost it they're usually talking about an experience you know but there's this deeper thing of like seeing clearly recognizing the nature of reality and then sort of losing it you still have it intellectually but you don't you're not you you can't experientially see the nature of reality because something else has taken over and it's too strong some some scar or unresolved experience or, or something like that you know and so what it seems to me is that the actually the biggest enemy to stability is the belief that there are things that are antithetical yes. to this state. Exactly. Yeah. And I, again, we return to this, this fundamental paradox that there's nothing that's not it. So when you say you've lost it, you, haven't, you, may, you can't lose it. How can no. you lose something that you are? Right. But you, just, can, you can make believe that you lost it. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you can make yeah. believe that you lost it. So for a brief moment, there's lack of recognition. And this again, yeah. you know, this ties in, um, Harish, to my own work where, um, you know, when I explore things like uh, lucid dreaming, I basically use lucidity as an archetype where lucidity is just code word for awareness. Mm. So lucidity principle is is recognition principle. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you recognize a dream to be a dream, 
that's lucid dreaming. That's mm-hmm. a moment of recognition. Mm-hmm. And so for me, th- this, this has a, a, a lot of very immediate bearing, both in my nocturnal and my diurnal practice, because how, in fact, can we continue to nurture ongoing recognition, both mm-hmm. in a relative and absolute way? Mm-hmm. I mean, a relative way, of course, pathway, purifying some scars, purifying karma, that whole sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I think that still has to be honored, mm-hmm. because otherwise, is it not so easy to, to slip into kind of absolutism, where you get lost in, in the absolute? Mm-hmm. But so maybe maybe let's, let's explore this a little bit further, using both, in fact, if both are viable, mm-hmm. to, to the viability of, of the relative upayas, mm-hmm. you know, for creating the, the proper atmosphere. Because in the Buddhist tradition, Harish, what they say, it's very interesting. Um, they talk about the five paths, which mm-hmm. are basically five stages on, mm-hmm. on the path to awakening. And really the pivotal point that we want to get to in this life is the third path, literally the path of seeing which we would say is the path of recognition. Mm -hmm. And it can be a very short path. I mean, it can be the moment of like one glimpse or one meditation session. Mm -hmm. But what creates the milieu, the environment for that, is merit, Mm -hmm. good karma. Mm -hmm. And what the Buddhists say is that you can have a master giving you pointing out transmission Mm 24-7. And why, why aren't those seeds coming to fruition? Yeah. Because there's not enough merit. So can you talk to us a little bit about yeah, that well, delicate juxtaposition between relative and absolute? Yeah, I mean, this yeah. is where the, the these our two traditions diverge a little bit. Okay. You know, because <clears throat> the Shaivas shifted the conversation radically by creating a, an initiation ritual that they believed, rightly or wrongly, they believed the initiation ritual utterly destroyed all karma except the karma already bearing fruit mm. in this life. And therefore, they shifted the conversation off this kind of obsession in, in the in the Asian traditions mm-hmm. with karma. And I think, you know, that was actually a smart thing to do. So just, just make sure I'm tracking you on this. Mm. This is super important. So is this like the analog to like a Shaktipat type of thing? No, no, or... no, no, no. If you receive... Receiving Shaktipat uh, is a phrase that means you've had an initial awakening that causes you to seek out initiation. Okay. And then initiation itself in the original tradition was a very elaborate mm-hmm. ritual of two or three days long, all day and all night, actually. So there's... It, so the exhaustion quality. Well, but no, no, no. No, no, all night in the sense that you sleep in the ritual ah, enclosure and then the initiating guru asks you about your dreams in the morning and so this you, the and does a little bit of augury because if the dreams have you know inauspicious signs they have to do certain rituals and da 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 so but but so the the initiates do sleep but as part Got of it. the ritual uh, uh, initiation but anyway yeah I don't want to kick you off track no they they believe sure yeah that. that this ritual. Um, which again was was elaborate and extremely convincing. <laughs> they, you know, if it was psychological theater, it was incredibly effective psychological theater, of the kind that has that we know from the good scientific evidence that, you know, people can even be cured of real physical ailments mm-hmm. through as in the purification of karma is real like through psychological real. theater, wow. right? Through through you know Mesmer and and and, yeah. and his uh, heirs. So. Anyway, the point is that they, they were convinced and, and uh, that the ritual successfully eliminated all their karma that would cause them to take birth in future lives otherwise. So it preserved only the karma already bearing fruit in this life. So what that meant was that it shifted the conversation completely to attaining liberation in this life and to what were the impediments to that, right? So now karma is no longer you know, considered a, a major impediment. Um, what, and, and I, I think this is also just true, not, not just metaphysically, but, but literally that the real impediment is not karma, but, um, something like that you are still entranced by drama. You're still entranced by the game, the drama, you know, to some extent. And, and because what makes the process really, really crystallized and, and stabilized is you just really don't want anything else, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I think that's, that's important that, that people 
it's like if you just look at how humans are affected by a TV, especially those people, you know, who who don't have a TV, like, you know, in village India or whatever, or or even just, you know, my mom. <laughs> she, doesn't, she, she doesn't have a TV. And when she's in a room with a TV... She can't help but watch it. She's like yeah. entranced. Maybe, maybe she's past this now. If if she's hearing this, sorry, <laughs> mom. But 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 you know, she would literally just get entranced by the yeah. TV and by like the drama yeah. unfolding on the yeah. screen. Yeah. Um, and in the same way that yeah. we we get caught by our own dramas, and I think that's that's the real operative thing when we're talking about karma, you know, and the, and so. It, the perspective that helps, I think, is, is I mean, it's got to be real, though. <laughs> You've got to actually be ready to see the truth of the fact that everything's ephemeral. Everything's just here for a moment. Everything you do will be forgotten in, in very short order, you know. Um, and all the human dramas are washed away, you know, mere moments after they've begun. You know, even if they last decades or centuries, that's still just moments, right? But uh, and they're only perpetuated by by individuals playing parts and in, in that ongoing drama, right? And some of the dramas are necessary. Like yeah. if people are involved in the drama of the of the fight for racial equality, you know that's that's a necessary drama. But this is this is where it's not contradictory because you can be involved in that and realize I'm just playing yeah. my part. You're an actor. I'm just here to play my part, but ultimately. It's not worth, you know, getting too worked up about because it's going to unfold. The historical process is going to unfold exactly as it does. And all I can do is play my part. Without uh, excessive investment. Yeah, because you can't. Dispassionate. And, and the reason to not be excessively invested is, A, you suffer less, but B, also because it's factually true that you can't control the outcome. So there's no point in being excessively invested, and yet humans do. They get so, you know, yeah. and they imagine these crazy things like uh, that they that they are making something happen. Like people love to be part of a movement because it's like we are making it happen. Yeah. But almost every significant movement, its its best results are beyond the lifetimes of yeah. the people involved, Absolutely. you know. So what you know, that's all you can do is play your part. But I hope, you know, it makes sense to listeners how we, we got here, right? Because there, there has to be, to, for, if you want the awakening process to really gel, as it were, there has to be a strong focus on truth in the deepest sense and, and, a, and a, a kind of what the tradition, the Sanskrit tradition calls... Uh, world weariness yeah renunciation literally. but 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 not where you're actually renouncing stuff right you're not becoming a monk or whatever you're not you're not having to give away all your possessions but the kind of world weariness that's just like yeah. you know what that's never going to do it for me in tibetan it's actually translated as definite emergence hmm. isn't it we're mostly partially emerged yeah so definite emergence is just what you're saying Hmm. That you're finally giving up on that narrative. And in fact, I think what you were talking about earlier, Garish, that really struck me was this is another way to talk about the ego's lust for narrative immersion. Because ego itself, the ego itself is archetypally, it's just a story mm -hmm. with a really bad ending. Mm -hmm. And so, as, as, as again, because that storyline is the archetypal storyline then in order to sustain that narrative, ego feeds on further narratives. Mm -hmm. And it's always constantly generating it. Yeah. And so we see this, I mean, this is why, isn't it not, the entertainment industry and its multifarious manifestations is a mm -hmm. multi-trillion dollar success story. Mm -hmm. Because it's fundamentally feeding this lust for non-lucidity, this yeah. lust for narrative immersion. Yeah. And so that's the, that's the emergence, is it not? Yes. That's, that's the renunciation. But, and there's a key point here, because in the absence of awakeness, the thing that makes humans feel most alive is drama. <laughs> you know, drama on a movie screen, drama in your life. We pay for it. Yeah, we pay for it, and, and we pay for it in, in daily we life. We pay for it with in, our in, lives. In suffering, too. Like, I'm willing to pay the price of suffering if I get the drama, yeah. because otherwise I will feel nothing, yeah. right? And so that's yeah. key, is that the, yeah. the only way out of the kind of endless spiral of drama and this is what samsara really means right because it's it's like a hamster wheel it's running on and on and on and on and on reruns reruns, reruns. yeah and, and the 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 
the the Sanskrit root is literally to run on. To run on. Oh, wow. Yeah, linguistically. Oh, like a, like in a run on story, like yeah. a run on sentence. Exactly. Oh my goodness. Huh. <laughs> so that's samsara, and and the only way out is to is to get a glimmer of the fact that to that to be fully that to be awake is better aliveness. Yeah. It's like a kind of yeah. purer life because the drama excitement of drama and the intensity of drama you know you're having the dramatic fight with your partner that you know could be in a movie about two passionate people you know yeah. that but that excitement is it it's energy but it doesn't have this sort of clean yeah. quality it's a substitute yeah that the, the the aliveness of being awake is is it doesn't it it's sort of untainted somehow yeah. experientially it feels different it's cleaner and uh, it's it, it feels like true aliveness that you don't even have to pay for. No wonder they use the term grace. Okay. And it's like, yeah, it's free. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. But it's also, from an ego perspective, boring. Yeah, oh, yeah, it could be. Could be. <laughs> that's why the that's why there has to be some of this world weariness, maybe. Um, you know, and 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 so it's either, you know, later on in life, or sometimes young people. They have enough of a sense of, I've been around this hamster wheel so many times. You know, I've been, they know, even if there's no memory or anything, but they, they know they've had other lifetimes and they're like, I, I don't want to get on this ride again. And that's why some young people get in, interested in, in awakening, you yeah. know. Yeah. And so, I mean, we're, we're circumambulating so many amazing topics. but And so, when we're looking for... <sighs> some of the more um, insidious traps. Mm. I mean, we're intimating a number of these, mm -hmm. but because, it is, I mean, we're hitting on some really important ones, Harish, because the more subtle it gets, the more slippery it gets. Mm -hmm. And you can have, like, you know, vikalpas, should have vikalpas, uh, mm -hmm. maybe you can help define those terms, mm -hmm. super important, because in many ways, your entire book is a should have vikalpa. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they become so subtle the map becomes so refined that we actually confuse it for the territory. Mm -hmm. So because we're talking with, with, in such a nuanced way, what in your own experience and also doctrinally have you seen as the principal biohazards here? <laughs> you know, what, yeah. what is it that some of the things to look out for so that we're not just kidding ourselves? Yeah. Because in a very real way, here, here's what here, the reason I bring this up is one of the things that blew me away by, by your book, and I actually it was so potent I wrote it underneath the title here, it talked me into it. <laughs> the, the book was it was in so it was so in resonance with reality mm -hmm. that it literally, and like the hermeneutical mysticism that you alluded to at the outset, it literally talked me into it. Yeah. But then, how do I know for sure? That's yeah. it's the double-edged sword right there. It talked me into it because it can happen one of two ways. So I'll, I'll try to outline these. Um. In it, the the most common thing, of course, that happens is the is the simulacrum <laughs> or the simulation of of awakening, and so what happens there is the person gets a book like the Recognition Sutras, and they sit in their armchair or in their garden, and they read that book, and the they t and they take the ideas in. Let's say they're just ripe to take in the ideas, and they even believe the ideas. They start to believe the ideas, and then that corresponds to a feeling when you believe any thought it generates a corresponding feeling just like if somebody believes oh i'm worthless i'm a piece of shit they feel terrible right but it's only because they're believing that thought and in the same way on the positive side you can believe the thoughts in that book or other books and feel wonderful and you can even feel that's it you know i'm feeling so wonderful believing these thoughts in this great book this must be enlightenment, yeah. you know, but, yeah. but it's not, you know, yeah. and it, you know, but it's, 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 it's not, it's fine as a phase. It's fine as a phase, but, but this is why we have like the market test, you know, like right. <laughs> this yeah. is where you need to, you need to, uh, you need to test your, yourself. And like, so if you go, if you're in a, whatever environment that isn't to your liking yeah. and, and people, you know, or people are, you know, denigrating you or whatever, if it's the simulated enlightenment, then it falls right. apart. It falls apart right away, yeah. <laughs> you know. And that's why, if you really think um, you're 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 getting it, you yeah. know, you sh you wouldn't even you wouldn't be afraid to ask. 
the universe or okay i want to test <laughs> you know to, let's test this out um and if the if the idea of asking for a test and meet causes you immediate trepidation that might be a sign <laughs> that, that, that you're actually in the simulation version and again the simulation is 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 lovely it's just not it's just it's just like cotton candy compared to the real thing, you know. Um, so the real, the real opportunity that you know, like you say, it talked me into it. That could be that phrase could also refer to some, to the, a different scenario, which is where the person reads the book and then instead of just believing the thoughts, in fact, they might not believe or disbelieve. They might just say, "I'm going to look where this is pointing." Yeah. You know, I'm just going to look yeah. and see what I discover. And and so in that sense, mm. you know, the, mm. the book or, or any such book is like mm. it's like a note mm. slipped to you by mm. God or the universe. Right. Mm. Like, here's a clue. Mm. Here's a clue on the path. Yeah. But then if you get the clue, yeah. you're going to go look for where yeah. it's pointing. You know, it's like yeah. the treasure in this metaphor, you know, yeah. and you're not going to just endlessly study the clue. Right. And how about, could you do this, Harish? Could you also then, in a similar way, actually take that feeling mm -hmm. when you feel like, you know, you're clicking into it mm -hmm. and then, then, then actually follow that feeling back in, so to speak. In other words, don't allow yourself to even potentially get lost in that feeling. Mm. What happens if you release to that feeling? Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm not even, it's, there's no even an I anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm no longer having this. There's just this ineffable, whatever you want to call it, energy, thatness, suchness, mm -hmm. ta, ta, ta. And then, um, simply as a practice, let, let that bring you back in. Mm -hmm. Where does that take you? And would it take you to something more authentic than that? Or is the display as itself just as, as, as authentic as what it's dissolving into? Does that make sense? I think so, but, but say it another way, just so I'm sure. Yeah, so, so what, 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 what brought to mind around that is that uh, I mean, one of the most powerful Dzogchen teachings that I've been able to paraphrase is we lose the essence in the display. Because the display is just so colorful, mm -hmm. so you know that's the that's the the root cause of non lucidity at, mm -hmm. at its at, at root. You mm -hmm. know the display is so brilliant. The Bardo mm -hmm. teachings are brilliant on this mm -hmm. that we get lost in the display, sure. and a large part of meditation is actually lessening the display to recapture the essence. So what I'm coming to here is that even when you're having that feeling that that, that you can get lost in that display as a practice, perhaps, and again this is an open question. Mm. That one could rest in that and then see when that dissolves what that takes you to. And whether you can relate to complete equanimity to both those. Yes, you yes. Yeah, and here maybe there's a little difference with Buddhism and Shaivism because the Shaivas don't recommend, the tantric Shaivas, I mean, don't recommend lessening the display. Mm. Right? Or trying to mute <laughs> reality. Mm. Right? Because they don't recommend any kind of manipulative no muffler, no muffler. yeah no, don't manipulate anything um because then you you strengthen this false sense of self that's trying to do stuff mm. you know um but here's the thing is like the display could be as as radical and colorful as possible but if we go to the the movie the movie metaphor um you know movies are projected on a blank screen right so no matter how colorful the display is, you could theoretically at any moment just remember there's a blank screen there that's the foundation of all this display. So in the same way, um, you know, the, the display could be colorful or it can be f faded. It can be momentarily gone. But there's always the foundation. The screen is always there, right? Which refers also to Sutra number two in Recognition Sutras where... The, uh, the word a word equivalent to screen is used in, in the original Sanskrit mm -hmm. or a, a surface on which you paint a, a fresco, you know, um, or, or a screen. The, so that metaphor enables the discussion of the aesthetic nature of experience, mm -hmm. but it's also very importantly talking about, you know, mm -hmm. Everyone gets caught up in the colorful display, and but forgets. Well, the the if without the screen, the, there is no display, <laughs> literally. So in that sense, um, yeah, 
watching, you know, watching the experience dissolve is instructive because what it dissolves into is pure, formless, spacious consciousness, right? <laughs> you know, you, you could say emptiness, but this emptiness is the nature of consciousness. Yeah. And so you can notice that, but there's a kind yeah. of... Yeah. The, it, the one issue is that a lot of Buddhists and, and some Shaivas, then they reify that into the more important thing and and sort of de-emphasize the display yeah. when for Shaivas, it's it, it's it's Shiva and Shakti and yeah. e, they're equally, yeah. you know, if we're, they're equally divine, right? Yeah. So Shakti is the display and Shiva is the formless ground of being. But... It's yeah. it's too easy to kind of separate yeah. them and 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 emphasize one over the beautiful. other. Beautiful. And, and in our lingo, we have the same parents of reality, um, Samantha Bhadra, Samantha Bhadri. Same. Mm -hmm. And and I think what you're saying, this is a really important point, Harish, because I, I see this a lot, even even in the classic liturgies of the Buddhist tradition, where where they say something like, um, the essence of thought is Dharmakaya, as is taught, nothing whatever, but everything arises from it. Yeah. That's a very profound statement. But when mm -hmm. I went in, in, in the line of this conversation, there's a subtle trap here as well, in my opinion, in that mm -hmm. it doesn't arise from it, because that still denotes a very subtle duality. Mm -hmm. It arises as it. Yes. And I think that that is an extremely subtle but radical, radically important point. Because even there, there's a subtle cosmological dualism going on. Yeah. If things are arising from consciousness instead of as consciousness... There still seems to be some recursive bed or something that I need to land to instead right. of the full, what we call svabhavakakaya, the complete unity, or in this case, I guess it would be triyatita, right? Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. complete recognition under all conditions. Yeah. And so it seems like the provisional separation of these is important, is a heuristic, mm -hmm. but then fundamentally, even that can become somewhat problematic. Yes. Yeah, one of my gurus was interviewed interviewed by a skeptical reporter, you know, and uh, who who's trying to understand this. Everything is the divine sort of teaching, <laughs> and the reporter said, um, "Oh, scoffing, sort of. Okay, so do you see God in that tree over there?" And and this meditation master said, "No, I see God as that tree." <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. So it's. Uh, you know, the, it, the tradition has a hard time coming up with metaphors for this because it's totally beyond <laughs> conception and beyond metaphor. But yeah, one way we could say it is consciousness, you know, infinite, formless, spacious, open, unparticularized consciousness bodies itself forth. Yeah. You know, it embodies its presences. Itself. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it as in this in an embodied form, but without ever departing from itself. Yeah. So the tradition was it was eager to emphasize that, you know, that this is not like um, a spider creates a spider web out of its body, which then comes out. You know, yeah. but actually consciousness manifests all its forms within itself. Yeah, and so they so that's why then there's here's a parallel. You know, it's like. Uh, you have tata, uh, tathagata garba, right. you know, yeah. and a very similar phrase, uh, paranada garba, you know, that this, that, that the universe is, as it were, you know, it's, it's, it's contains within itself in the way that a womb contains a, 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 a child, you know, the universe contains within itself a fundamental resonance of consciousness, paranada which then differentiates into all these harmonics, Beautiful. you know, is, is, is along the same lines. Spheres. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. And it just shows, you know, and again, it shows the limitations of language itself. Uh, linguistic constructs, as you know, you know, language is part of what separates man from beast, but it's also what separates man from God. Mm. You know that if we didn't have nouns, if we didn't, if we didn't linguistically freeze the world the way we do, I mean, the, we language is such a profound, and you write about this beautifully in your book, mm. um, inducer of the samsaric way of, of viewing things, mm -hmm. and and so this is why when we get to this sort of level, you really you start to shift to right brain where it's music, it's dance, it's poetry mm -hmm. that now speaks a language is probably truer. Mm. to this reality until eventually everything has to fall into silence, right? Yeah. yeah. So just a couple of questions here as, as we start to close up. You've been mm. so generous with your time. Again, a bit selfishly on my part, 
Does the, do the Nando Shaiva um, traditions have an analog of Bardo Yoga? I mean, it, to what degree is Thanatology or, or what the Tibetans work with as Bardo principles explored overtly in, in the Shaiva tradition? Uh, to my knowledge, not as extensively as in the Buddhist uh, tradition, but then I haven't reviewed all these materials that, that some of my colleagues have. Um, like there's some teachings on, on dream yoga in Tantra Loka chapter 12, which I haven't got to myself. Are you translating that text, by the way? Yeah, but, you know, several people are, are translating it. It's sort of a, it's, it's a race of tortoises to a finish line, <laughs> except we're all tortoises and we'll see who gets there. But, um, you know, Sanderson is translating Tantra Loka, Mark Dijkowski is translating it, um... I mean, I'm, 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 but uh, Sanderson's translation will be the best, uh, I'm sure, and, and Marx would be very valuable as well. But I'm just reading it, you know, to read it. And, it, and my, while I'm going, I might as well translate some, some parts. But, but anyway, um, so yeah, that's a kind of tantric encyclopedia. So that includes some, some material on dream yoga. It, uh, you know, there is this mantra to whisper in the ear of the dying. Um, which is paralleled in, in the Tibetan tradition, and um, this is called the Brahma Vidya in, in, in Shaivism. Brahma Vidya? Bra- yeah, I mean, it's related to the word Brahman, yeah. but bra- Brahma, yeah, Brahma Vidya. It's literally called the Brahma Vidya mantra? Yes, to... yes, yes. Um, I don't think it's... I don't know if anyone's done a study of it, but it's a lengthy, it's a lengthy mantra. Like a Dorani. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's maybe... A hundred syllables or something like that. Um, So, yeah, I'm hoping to um, do a study of that at at some point. Um, You know, of course, even though traditions focused on awakening are not... They're not religious in the same uh, sense. I mean, if they're institutionalized, they are, right? But it's like one one of my professors said, you know... Religion, in the final analysis, is all about hatch them, match them, and dispatch them. <laughs> and that's, that's what kind of distinguishes religion. It's like it's rites of passage, it's civic, you know, it's civic uh, cultural life as much as it's, uh, or more than it's related to spirituality. Mm-hmm. You know, so like the, the, the tantric traditions absorbed that religious material sort of half-heartedly and hesitantly like this is not really what it's about but they ended up doing all of that so they ended up so shaivas had death rituals you know they had and they had um a a whole kind of apparatus around that that i haven't studied that Mm -hmm. um uh, a colleague of mine who i knew at oxford is uh has studied that a lot Mm -hmm. and her name's nina mirnig and and uh i imagine reading her dissertation would would be instructive interesting for me yeah because especially, you know, in the so-called reincarnation, rebirth traditions, um, I find there's extraordinary elegance in the Tibetan view. But uh, it's what some scholars also refer to, I think, really compellingly, is a ritualized phenomenology. In other words, mm. who's to say, you know, can this, in fact, extremely articulate map be just a kind of, a, not just, but a ritualized way relating to this experience that brings meaning to it? It helps us to relate to it. Yes, so, uh, yes, but but it, it could easily be more than that because there were, uh, you know, back in the day. And again, I haven't studied this very much, but you know, one of my one of my professors, um, uh, who I mentioned before, Somde Vasudeva, he was telling me about, and, and I don't remember it vividly, but he was telling me about um, how back in the day there were folks who would induce near death experiences. Mm-hmm. In their meditations. Um, yes, yeah. and and even there were folks who would um, let themselves be bitten by poisonous snakes, yeah, and then like tell their tell their friends as soon as I fall unconscious, start start sucking out the poison. You know, <laughs> tie the tourniquet, start sucking out the poison. And right. some of them didn't didn't make it back, but they were willing to ride that edge to see what they could discover. And supposedly, some of some of this uh, research, this dangerous research, went into these to these articulations about the death passage from glimpses that people had gotten. But you know, ultimately, I would say that that perhaps surprisingly, the person who made the truest statement I know of in the English language about death was Alan Watts, 
who said, and, and people get this quote wrong often, but he said, um, there's, there's, no reason, there's no point being afraid of death because the only thing that can happen after you die is more of the same <laughs> of whatever happened before you were born. <laughs> you know that 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 but he was trying to make a statement that was that was um non-denominational because he's saying look if if you're an atheist or whatever you believe there's nothing after death well you believe therefore there's nothing before birth yeah. and you know you, that doesn't freak you out so why should this yeah. you know but if you're somebody who if you you know whatever whatever your belief system is um, you know what's what's universal is the is the teaching that the only thing that can happen after you die is more of what happened whatever before you were born, but not not it's a deeper statement than talking about samsara. It's talking about if if you believe there was consciousness before birth, yeah. there's going to be consciousness after death. Yeah. You know, so it's at that fundamental level, and I, I think that's that that's very true, and that's the only thing we can say about death that everyone can hear. Everyone can heed that 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 invitation, that contemplation, you know. Um, whereas everything else about after death is differentiated by religion and irreconcilable, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but the but one other thing I was talking about is that w one of my most respected teachers, fully realized being, uh, he 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 said he argued and and he's had you know, near death experiences and 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 he's been. Uh, He's been a psychopomp as well, mm. and somebody, yeah, who, who facilitates the spirit crossing over for others. And he said, actually, we can't tell you what happens after you die, because it depends on you. <laughs> Meaning to say, consciousness has the power to manifest anything, at least temporarily. Yeah. You know. And he said, yeah, Christians who expect heaven, they get that for a little while. Yeah. You know, and so on. Yeah. So, so that was an interesting statement. Well, you know, it's interesting. I'm sure you know that that one of the ways the Buddhist tradition approaches this is to look at the illusory nature of what we call I even now. Hmm. And that fundamentally that can, uh, that cannot die, which was never born. Right. And so, in fact, um, uh, one of my favorite thinkers these days is a uh, uh, Zen practitioner philosopher, David Loy, really mm. clever character. Mm. Um, he talks about it in, in a really uh, a compelling way that the fundamental fear is really not fear of death. Mm -hmm. Um, the fundamental fear is that you're dead right now. In other words, that you know this thing called self does not exist, mm -hmm. and therefore, and he conflates a little bit. Doesn't conflate, but he um, works a little bit with Ken Wilber's ideas here that that then what we do an incredibly sophisticated avoidance strategy is we mm -hmm. repress and project, mm -hmm. and so the fundamental fear of our inherent the truth of the harshest of all noble truths mm -hmm. that we don't exist right now is then contracted, repressed, and projected into the future. Mm -hmm. And hence it's deferred. Ah. And so we defer the truth of our empty nature by throwing it into the future. And yes. hence we're afraid of death. When yes. fundamentally, what we're, that's a substitute fear. Yes. The authentic fear is we don't exist right here, right now. Well, and the, we can prove this, actually, because when people come up against the kind of final um, transit, as it were, of this awakening journey, where where individuality, you know, or selfhood, personhood is is about to die, you feel terror. You you feel terror in the face of that. And you know, what actually happens depends on the person. It can it can go in a bang or a whimper <laughs> or you know, it could but it's it's usually not what you think, you know. But the terror is in fact what what when people come up against the dissolution of 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 this selfhood or personhood mm -hmm. They often really believe I'm physically going to die, exactly, because they're conflating. Yeah, but that exactly, and the heart is pounding, yeah. and yeah. that's the amazing thing is that nobody's afraid of physical death. Everybody's afraid of psychic death. That's exactly right. <laughs> Whenever it happens, yeah. now or 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 at the time of physical death, you know. Yeah. So that yeah, that's a it's, fascinating isn't thing, isn't it? And then to tie this into the very beginning about about the story of you, mm. death is only the end if you think the story is about you. Yeah, yeah. So change the narrative. Yeah, or fundamentally, just get rid of the stories altogether. Yeah, I mean, is that possible? Yeah, remove the storylines, and then you just inhabit the storylines voluntarily as upayas, as skillful means. Yeah, you don't even need to inhabit them. You just—they're just tools. Yeah, you know, they're skillful just means. yeah, the tools. Yeah, the, for communication. Exactly. You know, um, 
So here's a, here's an interesting perspective. Uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj. Yeah, I love this guy. Yeah, he said he said something once. This is a great example of an awake person saying something <laughs> that just sounds completely crazy from the ordinary point of view, but it's actually not. What, you know, he said to one of his students sitting there in front of him, "Who came first, you or your parents?" And the guy said, "Well, my parents, of course." And Nisargadatta said, "Really? Is that your direct experience?" And the guy's like, I'm, "No, I'm I'm just repeating what I've been told." He says, "Exactly. Look at your direct experience. You were always there, right? Yeah. And you can't remember the beginning because it's beginningless." Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> and your parents are just um, amongst the first humans to appear in the ambit of consciousness as you remember it. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and and that's absolutely touching on a deep truth that it that again just might sound crazy, but it's it has to do with stepping outside of storyland yeah. and into reality as seen from any given vantage exactly. point. Yeah. Exactly. It's fantastic. And that's what I like to replace person with. Yes. Right. Exactly. Instead of person, yes, it's exactly. vantage point. Yeah, exactly. Vantage yeah. point. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And so, Harish, as we start to, to, to wrap this up, I mean, what a rich um, array. It feels like on one level we've talked about everything, but we, on one <laughs> level we just kind of scratched the surface. Yes. <laughs> what are you working on now? Um, and how can we, what, one of the charters of what we do is kind of this cross-pollination support network where um, part of our charter is to introduce people to your work, mm. to support you in, a, in whatever way we can. Um, tell us what you're working on now and, and how... Um, we can support you directly or indirectly in your future trajectory? Well, there's a few books in the works um, that, you know, I, for some reason I'm just working on several simultaneously and uh, one needs to be finished um, at a time. <laughs> so i got this book coming. This is probably the next one, which is um, Near Enemies of the Truth. Yeah, wonderful. And that is looking at how deep, deep spiritual truths get reduced to cliches and how the cliche version of the spiritual teaching is actually dangerous. So examples would be things like you create your own reality. Yeah. Everything happens for the best. Um, you follow your bliss. Uh, you know, the list, Fantastic. the list goes on. Um, uh, I can respond to, no, I can choose how I respond. That's another near enemy. And again, all of these are in a way deeply, deeply true. But in their bumper sticker versions um, end up uh, pr being misunderstood to such an extent that they, that they become an enemy to the truth. Yeah. So it's a near enemy to the yeah, truth. I, I riff on near enemies a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And then, and then I'm also uh, working on a translation and commentary on... The so, the, so not to... Uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. The first one, then, this is, this is not a translation text. So right. This is, no, this is, this is just... Riff. Yeah, this is just a, 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 I saw a need <laughs> to yeah, address these exactly. these near enemies, and I'm drawing on teachings from from tantra, but also um, just you know common sense from the awake yeah. perspective. One might say, yeah. Well, the other the really fun thing to play with this, in a, in, a, in in fact, in an alchemical or tantric way, is near friends. Mm. Same thing. Mm. So wherever you've got the shadow side, you always have light. The brighter the light, the darker the shadow. Mm. The darker the shadow, the brighter the light. Mm. And so this is just a sidebar. This is why I find it so elegant to really probe deeply into the darkest thing called death. Mm. Because fundamentally, if you go right into that, the, the greatest of all lights, you know, the greatest friend is hidden yeah. in that enemy. Yes, yeah, yeah, because if you address and face and, and go through the heart of your deepest fear, all other fears fall away. Exactly. As well. As well. Yeah, that I think is very important. Because people do try to solve their their perceived problems piecemeal. You know? And that's what they go to therapists for and spiritual teachers for. And for for a spiritual teacher it's frustrating. It's like why are you trying to solve one problem after another piecemeal when you could just Take care of it all at once. Yeah. Oh, I have to share the story. <laughs> yeah. So Zuka Kuntra Rinpoche, I don't know if you ever met him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's quite a wrathful. I, I love this guy. Um, he's actually centered down in Crestone. And uh, he, did a, he did a big program uh, up in Boulder a number of years ago. And he, he's really kind of semi-wrathful, mm -hmm. you know, Chakras and Barra kind of guy. And typical Boulderite was just like going on about, you know, I'm processing this, I'm working with a therapist, mm -hmm. this. And after, you know, listening patiently for like five, ten minutes, Rinpoche just cut him off and said, 
you Westerners, you're always processing, <laughs> processing. Yeah. Cut the processing and get to the nintig. You know, yeah. get to the hard essence. Yeah. So yeah, because all the processing. I mean, it can processing can be sometimes important for relational uh, harmony, but the vast majority of it is just is just autobiographical narrative and regurgitation <laughs> exactly it's it's like once you see what it really is it's like bile in your throat exactly. you know? exactly. um but yes <laughs> so the second book the, the translation text well s several translations are happening um i mean the translation part's re relatively the easy part it's the is the commentary because as you saw with recognition sutras um and I take seriously the, the notion that translate means to bring all the way across, etymologically, you know, means to bring all the way across. So you haven't actually translated the work unless it lands for your audience. And most translations are halfway. They, they are only comprehensible to other Sanskrit scholars, you know. Um, it's, so it's like they're, they're crib sheets for other Sanskrit scholars. But... To bring it all the way across, you know, the cultural translation, the cultural translation that is part of a huge. Without that, it's not fully yeah. translated. Yeah. So, so that's what takes time. So, Vigyana Bhairava Tantra is this interesting scripture that sits very close to the to the to the nexus to the junction point of of Buddhism and Shaivism. Mm. It, so, it's it's full of Buddhist sort of language. Um, it's, it's, you know, half the text is, is about emptiness, mm. uh, and, and the other half is about, uh, you know, sort of display, you might say, but, but how to engage the display of embodiment in a way that fosters realization. So it's, it's really such a Fantastic. profound work, um, in just 162 verses. Wow. Yeah. Um, but, but with a lot, a lot, a lot of practices. And then um, Spandakarikas, mm. that's yeah, stanzas on pulsation. We referred to that concept in our conversation of oscillating between expansion yeah. and contraction. And yeah, which by the way, parenthetically, Harish, is very interesting. Mm. The cognitive neuroscientists um, have actually ascertained, and this may be no surprise to you with your traditional readings, that that literally awareness itself pulsates. Mm. That that it actually has like a a, 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 a miniature wake sleep cycle. Of, of high cycles of optimal excitability mm -hmm. and then the kind of depressed cycles. And this is actually very interesting to know for meditators mm. because it is in that low, in that ebb of the pulsation where distraction comes in. Yeah. That's where the mind gets infected. But I wonder what, what the frequency of that pulsation is. Well, they, they actually measure it, you yeah. know, and they've done studies um, with meditators. And so the untrained mind. Mm. 110 to 150 milliseconds or 110 to 200 I can't remember mm -hmm, exact mm -hmm, numbers mm -hmm, with a millisecond being a thousandth of a second mm -hmm. but and this is no surprise as well in a trained mind 10 times faster mm -hmm. you know 10 to 15 milliseconds mind moments you know resolutions of, of discernibility again the kind of the right. you know, Abhidharma approach to things interesting interesting so that I would that that's really interesting to me again in terms of like the fractal nature of the spanda thesis mm. that even down turtles all the way down oscillations all the way down even mm -hmm. mind moments even awareness itself yeah and an, and potentially on an even deeper level so i, I got to see Stuart hammer off oh, yeah. at this yeah, yeah. at this conference in, uh, that was on about consciousness and um <clears throat> some really great speakers there anil seth and and oh, yeah. um yeah. francis crick yep yeah. um and Stuart Hameroff, and, you know, I had never taken him that seriously, but now I do, because, you know, as an anesthesiologist, he got into the study of consciousness for a very good reason, which With is... Roger Penrose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. providing the, the, the information quantum, from, the quantum from the quantum mechanical side, because Hameroff noticed, well, we don't know why anesthesia, anesthesia works. Like, a lot of people, the general public doesn't even realize this, that nobody actually knows how anesthesia works and 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 we just use it because it works but like the mechanism is not understood because why should something why should this particular chemical substance or compound take out consciousness but not anything else yeah. leaving the body alive you know but consciousness is offline in that from that vantage point in that body and um so he, he's he's definitely onto something and what with with penrose they got to was um 
you know, there's these micro microtubules, microtubules yeah. yeah, quantum microtubules, and the and the oscillation at that level can be pinned down. And he was talking about how they're they're they they they're pinning it down to a very specific frequency now, which is the frequency dampened by anesthesia. Um, that if you know, if correct, that's the frequency of consciousness at the quantum level in an in embodied form. You know, because yeah. Penrose also theorizes that. Um, after death consciousness could be possible if consciousness shifts from uh, having a, 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 a brain locus yeah. to having a locus in the quantum foam. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah. Which perhaps we could hypothetically correlate with subtle body processes? I mean, have you heard, read anything well, about mo- that kind of conjecture? No, I mean, for, I would say most, most subtle body things are, that's all happening on the level of psyche. You know, and that's still brain bound. It's part of the body mind system. But I would look to things like, um, you know, if you saw this book with a very cheesy title, uh, Proof of Heaven. I've read it. By Evan, Evan Alexander. I've read it. Evan yeah, Alexander's yeah. book. So the, what's fascinating to, to me about that is he's having this hyper real, yeah. hyper lucid experience, more real than, than waking, ordinary waking state, right? And then when he is coming out of it again, when he's coming back into his body, he describes quite quite intriguingly the the shift of consciousness to brain based consciousness. He may not use that exact phrase, but what his brain was all messed up by the meningitis, yeah. right? And there's no understanding scientifically how he could have this hyper lucid, hyper real experience. When, when that's all flatlined. Yeah, because not only flatlined, but his brain was 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 deranged by the meningitis by both before and after the flatline right so he and he when he comes back into his his brain based consciousness he's temporarily psychotic you know so this t- to my mind um correlates or dovetails at least with penrose's theory That's interesting. that if consciousness shifted its substrate yeah. from brain to quantum yeah. foam no wonder he has this yeah. radically he different subsended experience. the brain yeah and then and then came back into it, 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 it yeah and so and you know what's really just an interjection there Harvey, is it, 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 when you have these type of near death experiences in, in, in my estimation and I haven't had that but I've had so called near death spiritual experiences you know mm-hmm. uh, like hyper lucid dreams for instance mm-hmm. that are just like that hyper lucid dreams when you wake up from those suckers this appears to be the foggy dream yes exactly and just like with a near with a near death experience and this is one reason just throwing into the mix of these nocturnal practices, you don't have to have NDEs over and over for them to change your life. No. Because they're so foundational, they're yeah. so true, they're so irrevocably true, that you come up from one of those suckers and it shapeshifts the entire trajectory of your life. Yeah. And so you can have these types of experiences a little bit more volition- volitionally, gracefully, so to speak, through spiritual mm-hmm. practice. Mm-hmm. But it's a type of transmission. Mm-hmm. And it's really a type of transmission practice. Yeah. So... So anything else? I mean, like yeah. that's not enough. I mean, that's <laughs> well, I'm yeah, I'm hoping to take take some time off, you know, other activities so I can do a bit more writing, which is a bit which is like a personal retreat. I mean, that is your practice, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, really, you know, I mean, my daily schedule. I get up, I do my morning official so called practice, and then I have the great luxury of three to five hours to sit down and enter this kind of samadhi, you know, where, yeah. where I, it's just. And as you know, when you enter those states, I'm not writing this shit. No. It's not coming for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, sometimes I'll even like read a page in, in, in one of my books, quote unquote, and be like, whoa. Whoa. (laughs) That's bad. Where'd that come from? Yeah. I definitely couldn't write that. Isn't it? It's the most amazing thing. But I thought it would be nice to end with just a, just a a tiny few sentences of reading. Uh, from 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 recognition sutras, because what you brought to mind was this little piece of poetic prose that Chamaraja writes in in chapter nineteen. Do you notice how marked up that sucker? <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Um, because this 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 describes it so well. So the great tantric master Kshemadaja, who lived a thousand years ago in the valley of Kashmir, summed it up this way. That meditator who has attained immersion into the center 
in the post-meditative state as well, swaying blissfully as if drunk with the afterglow of the sweet taste of samadhi, sees the mass of existent things dissolving into the sky of awareness like wisps of autumn cloud. Again and again taking the support of the turn within, touching pure oneness with awareness through the method of inward turning samadhi, eventually there is no longer a post-meditative state. He has become one, for whom samadhi is the one taste. Yeah, so specifically this, th this part about dissolving like wisps of cloud, it's, it's objectness that dissolves like wisps of autumn cloud into the sky of awareness, you know. And, and, and in that sense, yeah, like the, the, exactly as you said, the object world is, is, is merely a, a dream from the point of view of ordinary consciousness realizing the truth, Right. But it's also a, a vision of beauty. Yeah. You know? Yeah, aesthetic. Yeah. But, uh, chamatkara? Is chamatkara, that, yeah. A beautiful word. Yeah. Chamatkara. Yeah, just to see the, the infinite display of appearances yeah. is, is, is beautiful. And it's not. To, the problem with using the term dream like is that people think it's, it is to be discounted then exactly. or dismissed, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. Well, Harish, my friend, what a, what a treat. It's been an honor. What a wealth of information. We have to do this again, and I will absolutely positively find my way to Portugal. Cool. And we'll do something. So safe travels, dear friends. Um, yeah. Extraordinary feast of offerings. And, uh, so thank you. We'll keep up the, the work. Uh, my friend, you're, you're making a very positive influence on this world. It really needs your light. Um, and so basically, um, much love to you. Safe yeah. travels, and we'll do it again. Thank you. Om. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the episode. Remember, you can always find out more about the tradition of non-dual Shaiva Tantra at tantrailluminated.org, where, if you wish, you can become a subscriber to our online learning portal, and you'll receive access to a vast number of recordings, including a comprehensive curriculum in tantric philosophy, tantric yoga, guided meditation, and much, much more. Music for the podcast, composed and recorded by Anne Leader. Find her at anneleader.com. Podcast produced by Grazia Tribulato. New episodes drop every week. And may all beings benefit.